Hello and welcome to this exploring session. And today we are looking at Gorba ah. Duck. Um, uh, or Gorba Duck. Uh, that's not my joke, by the way. I've seen that uh, online. It's not original. Um, or uh, should we call it Gorba Duck? Well, perhaps we should go by the title page, The Tragedy of Ferrix and Porrex set forth without addition or alteration, but altogether as the same was showed on stage before the Queen's Majesty in January 1561 by the gentleman of the Inner Temple, of course, 1561. January 1561 might technically be 1562, depending on your argument of when a, a year begins and ends. It's all a little confusing. Uh, but it is a play from the early reigns of uh, Elizabeth, She's been on the throne for a few years now. Her, her legs aren't going numb yet. And um, we have a, 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 a new style of theatre possibly coming into play. Um, and this is written by two chaps, Thomas, uh, Thomas Norton and Thomas Sackville. And I believe the, uh, the, there's a notation saying that uh, one wrote three of the acts and the other wrote the other two. So we'll, we'll test that little proposition as we go. Um, we're going to take our time uh, looking at this play over three sessions, uh, unless we rattle ahead, in which case it might contract down to two, but I don't think that's going to happen. We'll see where we get. Um, this is a play that I've been looking at for a, a while now, thinking about how to stage it today, as well as how they may have staged it in the past to help explore this question. Uh, I'm going to go to the fabulous readers in the room. We have a lovely little ensemble today. And we were just discussing pronunciation, so please don't shoot the pianist. He's trying his best. So, uh, reading Videna, Philander, and Hermon is... Hi there, I'm Sasha Cooper, and I'm a professional actress, dancer, director, writer, and all-round performer and voiceover artist based in Brighton in the UK. And uh, reading uh, Eulibus, or Eulibus, or Bulus, or anyway, and Chorus is... <laughs> Currently muted. Still currently I, muted. I, I'm Greg and I work for the NHS. And uh, reading Ferrix, Arustus and uh, The Dumb Show as well is... Hi, I'm Ruth Evans. I'm a specialist in medieval English literature and I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri in the US. And reading Gorbaduk and Dorden is... My name is Alexandra, and when I'm not in hiding from a tiny little monster, I act professionally. So, and I am uh, your host, Robert Crichton, and at the moment I'm going to be an argument. So <laughs> let's start this off with, with the argument of the tragedy. So let us remember, ladies and gentlemen, that this is the good old days when the history of the kings of Britain was much longer and much more fun. Uh, kings and queens of Britain uh, where the, the, the idea of what is history is, uh, is a little more fluid and flexible and there's a lot more stories that we can tell. So the story of this play, as, as in the printed edition, Gorbodok, King of Britain, divided his realm in his lifetime to his sons, Ferrex and Porrex. The sons fell to dissension. The younger killed the elder. The mother, that more dearly loved the elder, for revenge killed the younger. The people, moved with the cruelty of the fact, rose in rebellion and slew both father and mother. The nobility assembled and most terribly destroyed the rebels. And afterwards, for want of issue of the prince, whereby the succession of the crown became uncertain, they fell to civil war, in which both they and many of their issues were slain, and the land for a long time almost desolate and miserably wasted. So a fun night out for all the family. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yes, the themes here of, of uh, division, of uh, civil war, of things falling apart, and there's a historical narrative we can play into uh, in, in different times uh, that we will probably discuss as we go. Uh, but let us get on with the play. So, uh, each act, I think pretty much each act, opens with a dumb show. We haven't had many dumb shows. We've had one or two. Um, 
but this uh, this uh, this uh, play is features them very prominently and we'll go through these dumb shows uh, possibly in uh, more detail than we would in others so if i could ask um uh it's ruth has the joy of being the dumb show if you could uh, show the order of the dumb show before the first act and the signification thereof first the music of the violins began to play during which came in upon the stage six wild men clothed in leaves of whom the first bore in his neck a faggot of small sticks which they all both severally and together assayed with all their strengths to break but it could not be broken by them at the length one of them plucked out one of the sticks and broke it and the rest, plucking out all the other sticks one after another, did easily break, the same being severed, which being conjoined they had before attempted in vain. After they had this done, they departed the stage, and the music ceased. Hereby was signified that a state knit in unity doth continue strong against all force, but being divided is easily destroyed. As befell upon Duke Gorboduc dividing his land to his two sons, which he before held in monarchy, and upon the dissension of the brethren to whom it was divided. And we'll pause there. We seem to have lost Greg. I don't know where he's gone. Hopefully he'll be yeah. back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, um, we've got music, we've got a nice, very simple, actually, visual image being presented here. Um, and, you know, I, I always find that with dumb shows is actually how they feel very modern, uh, or modern feels very dumb show. Um, that you open the show with, a, uh, with some music and a bit of display and, you know, uh, how many productions have we all seen where you get sudden plunging into darkness people wander around the stage music playing and they set up what the court looks like or what or, 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 or create a setting that a play doesn't necessarily have and the authors have really thought about that um i mean how long does this dumb show go on for um thoughts on the room uh it, it's obviously it's just breaking some sticks but <laughs> <laughs> There are several um, stories, are there not, of various historical personages um, using this exact example of, you know, uh, try breaking this bunch of sticks. Ah, look, but if you separate them, you know, you'll, you'll, you will be able to, and here is the lesson that you need to learn. I'm thinking, I don't know exactly, but I think there are fairy tales and stories like that. Mm. It, yes, there are it, multiple I... examples of I, I, I think, yes, as a, as a sort of example, uh, it, it does seem to appear in lots of places, I think. Um, I don't know if anyone else in the room uh, knows of uh, a, any, any places where it might um, obviously come from. I haven't come across this, but I think the folktale aspect is very strong. Mm. And the six wild men, that's, again, that's a kind of, that's a motif, a folk motif as well, isn't it? Mm. Yes, I'd, I'd forgotten there were wild men. You know, it's not just anybody demonstrating this. It's, um, that, that, that's really interesting. Um, well, they could be like Morris dancers or something like that. They're dressed in leaves. Yeah. Well, I suppose we're talking about the ancient past. So, um, you know, wildness and, you know, uh, chaos, fears of chaos, which this play, uh, play, I think, is probably, by the argument, going to be really, really interested in. There's a specific representation, isn't there? The, the wild men sort of costume that has, uh, you know, a particular kind of, I don't know, significance or, or symbolism. There's a, there's a story about um, some sort of presentation. Um, it's, it's, it's really well known as a historic event where it was a, a presentation in which some of the wild men caught fire, the costumes caught mm. fire. And they were being played by nobility. I don't remember what that event uh, exactly is, but I can look it up. Mm. Uh, so I, I know that, that, that this idea of the specific kind of costume and specific symbolism, they're not just wild men in general. Mm. There's, some, there's a meaning to it. Yeah. And that's the question. Of, is there a, or for that matter, do we need an analogue um, for a modern production? Uh, I mean, the central image itself is very clear. Um, but can we tap into that that story if there is a there is more of a connection? 
Any additional thoughts? Gregory, I hope, is still staying with us this time. I am, hopefully, this time. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay. Um, let's bear that all in mind as we go into Act 1. So, we have uh, the entrance of two characters. Uh, Videna, 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 uh, and Ferex. So, we've got the Queen, the wife to King Gorbadoc, and we also have the Elder Son coming on stage now. The silent night that brings the quiet pause from painful travails of the weary day prolongs my careful thoughts and makes me blame the slow aurora that so for love or shame doth long delay to show her blushing face. And now the day renews my grief or plaint. My gracious lady and mother dear, pardon my grief for your so grieved mind. To ask what cause so tormenteth your heart? So great a wrong and so unjust despite, without all cause, against all course of kind. Such causeless wrong and so unjust despite may have redress, or at the least revenge. Neither, my son, such is the froward will, the person such, such my mishap and thine. Mine know I none. But grief for your distresses. Yes, mine for thine, my son. A father? No. In kind, a father, but not in kin kindliness. My father? Why? I, I know nothing at all where where wherein I have misdone unto his grace. Therefore, the more unkind to thee and me. For knowing well, my son, the tender love that I have ever borne and bear to thee, he grieved thereat is not content alone to spoil thee of my sight, my chiefest boys, my chiefest joys. But thee, of thy birth, right and heritage, causeless, unkindly, and in wrongful wise, against all law and right, he will bereave. Half of his kingdom he will give away. To whom? Even to Porex, his younger son, whose growing pride I do saw suspect, that being raised to equal rule with thee, methinks I see his envious heart to swell, filled with disdain and with ambitious pride, the end the gods do know, whose altars I full oft have made in vain of cattle slain to send the sacred smoke to heaven's throne. For thee, my son, if things so succeed, as now my jealous mind misdemeaneth sore. Madam, leave care and careful plaint for me. Just hath my father been to every wight, his first injustice he will not extend to me, I trust, and give no cause thereof. My brother's pride shall hurt himself, not me. So grant the gods, but yet thy father so hath firmly fixed his unmoved mind, that plaints and prayers can do no whit avail. For those have I essayed, but even this day he will endeavour to procure assent of all his counsel to his fond device. Their ancestors from race to race have borne true faith to my forefathers and their seed. I trust they equal bear the like to me. Their rest of all. But if they fail thereof, and if the end bring forth an evil success of them and theirs, the mischief shall befall. And so I pray the gods requite it them. And so they will, for so is wont to be when lords and trusted rulers under kings do please the present fancy of the prince. With wrong transpose, the course of governments, murders, mischief, or civil sword at length or mutual treason, or just a revenge, when right succeeding line returns again by Jove's judge, just judgment and deserved wrath, brings them to civil and reproachful death, and roots their names and kindreds from the earth. Mother, content you, you shall see the end. The end? Thy end, I fear. Jove, end me first. And they exit. So we've got this nice short opening scene. It's doing plot, but it's also giving character at the same time, which is really nice. Um, mm. You know, we're getting a sense that, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, people are mentioning each other's relationship to each other, but they're not really, they're not really, thankfully, saying each other's names in really un, 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 un implausible ways, which would annoy me. <laughs> yeah. You get that in modern drama when everyone comes on, on and says, hi, I'm... I will say my full name at you um, in a way that nobody in real life ever does. Um, but no, this <laughs> is, it's just, uh, you know, my, um, uh, my mother dear um, and, and things like that. And you get the relationship quite quickly. Um, mm. You know, and bad things happen, you know, and people know when bad things are happening and they can see when bad things are going to happen. Um, and, and that's, uh, it immediately sets um and extends on that that opening image thoughts on the room uh before i talk too much i think it's very clear uh for what um for what it read, read like to me it's very it's very clear that uh she's concerned that everything's going to go really wrong she knows what her husband's like even though we don't know his name at this point we know something is not right and the son's trying his best to calm her and make her feel at ease, but it's just not working. And it's clear that from some of the things that Videna says, you know, um, that she's more inclined towards the younger son, Ferex, at this point. Uh, my favorite bit was um, literally when she, um, um, you, you know, when, when he says, my father, why? I know nothing at all. When and I've misdone under his grace. And she says, therefore, the more unkind to thee and me, which just in that tiny, tiny section, it sums up the close relationship that they have and also how she views her husband, whoever he may be at this point. It's quite neatly done, actually. Mm. How, how do we... See Oh, sorry. Go Rip. No, go Ruth. No. Well, I was going to say that you can see how, just following on from what Sasha has just said, which is very good, um, the <laughs> idea that Ferex kind of sees himself as so blameless that you feel that it's, he's being set up to be for something terrible to happen. I mean, even if you didn't have the mother's comments, you'd, you'd be thinking that. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you get that sense of in, impending doom, don't we? <laughs> it almost feels like, and I hate using the phrase, but it almost feels like spot the stiff. That one of them is going to die. <laughs> don't, don't walk down that path alone. Exactly. Uh, Things no. not say in a horror movie or in a revenge tragedy, almost. It's that sort of, yeah, it just feels like... Yeah, not good. Yeah, but, uh, um, could I could I support the horror movie theory with uh, a little <laughs> bit of a of a um, return to the the six wild men? Mm. Um, I I looked up why I had the image of wild men catching fire. Um, there is it. The event was the uh, Bal des Ardentes. Um, and it was 1393 in France. Uh, one of the participants was our friend Charles VI, who then gave his crown to uh, Henry V. Um, this morning. Well, yeah, he <laughs> promised, <laughs> promised his, his crown to Henry V this morning. Um, but also, this was something, this was, this was uh, happening at the royal court, and there were six men, including the king, dressed as wild men. Um, for, the, the, there was someone caught fire and then four of them died of their of their injuries so to present this before the queen because this is the account we're reading we're we're, we're looking at something a description of what was presented before the queen to go look here are six people in in wild man attire does this remind you of anything catastrophic <laughs> and anyway let's talk about a, a catastrophe you know in the first scene or, or an impen let's give you a sense of impending catastrophe in the prologue in the first scene you know, it's leading somewhere very horror movie esque. Mm. Um, and, and, and you know, the Queen is not uh, not adverse to uh, to uh, um, uh, her own uh, uh, on stage disasters. Um, as I can't remember what year it is, but the, she went to see an entertainment where a wall collapsed and several people died. Um, and they still did the play. She she quite enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> and that's basically the report. It's in one of the read volumes. Uh, I was just uh, I was just going. That's the takeaway, is they still did the play, oh, even though there was a massive disaster where, where you know, the crush in the, in the building killed several people and, you know, bodies being cleared and, and no, still did the play. Someone well, forgot their the lines. this is the era when executions were entertainment, isn't it? Yes. Mm. <laughs> 
Um, so, so we've had this sort of little, little. Um, we've had a starter. Let's 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 move into uh, in into the next course. Um, Can I just quickly a, a say that I love the way this is all set up in a very Oedipal way? So you've already got the ingredients. You know, you've got. Uh, a kind of a, mo a mother who's kind of really loves her son and the son who's maybe just a little bit too fond of her and then you've got this evil father somewhere off so you, again the sense of impending doom with the the whole Oedipal setup. Mm. Oh, I like that. Um, huh? Let's find out how evil people are. are. Is it unfair? You know maybe maybe there's the, there's there's another maybe there's another side. We haven't met the other brother yet. Okay, so second scene, um, we will have in the room at some point, I don't know if they're all here at the same, at the beginning, but we will have Gorbadoc, we will have Rostus, uh, Philander, and Eubulus. Eubulus. Uh, I don't know if, I think one of them may enter later, um, but uh, they're all in this scene. So, Gorbadoc, King, you have the floor. My lords, whose grave advice and faithful aid have long upheld my honour and my realm, and brought me to this age from tender years, guiding so great a state with great renown. Now more importeth me the erst to use your faith and wisdom, whereby yet I reign, that when my death when by death my life and rule shall cease. The kingdom yet may with unbroken course have certain prince by whose undoubted right your wealth and peace may stand in quiet stay. And eke that they whom nature hath prepared in time to take my place in princely seat, while in their father's time their pliant youth yields to the frame of skillful governance, may so be taught and trained in noble arts, as what their fathers which have reigned before have with great fame derived down to them, with honour they may leave unto their seat and not be taught for their unworthy life, and for their lawless swerving out of kind, worthy to lose what law and kind then gave, but that they may preserve the common peace, the cause that first began and still, still maintains the lineal course of king's inheritance for me, for mine, for you, and for the state whereof both I and you have charge and care. Thus do I mean to use your wounded faith to me and mine and to your native land. My lords, be plain, without all wry respect or poisonous craft to speak in pleasing wise, lest, as the blame of ill succeeding things shall light on you, so light the hearts also. Your good acceptance, so most noble king, of such your faithfulness as heretofore we have employed in duties to your grace, and to this realm whose worthy head you are, well proves that neither you mistrust at all, nor shall we need in boasting wise to show our truth to you, nor yet our wakeful care for you, for yours and for our native land. Wherefore, O King, I speak for one as all, saith all as one do bear you equal faith, Doubt not to use their counsels and their aids, whose honours, goods, and lives are whole avowed to serve, to aid, and to defend your grace. My lords, I thank you all. This is the case. Ye know, the gods, who have the sovereign care for kings, for kingdoms, and for commonweals, gave me two sons in my more lusty age, who now, in my deceiving years, are grown well towards riper state of mind and strength to take in hand some greater princely charge. As yet they live and spend their hopeful days with me and with their mother here in court, their age now asketh other place and trade, and mine also doth ask another change. Theirs to more travail, mine to greater ease. When fatal death shall end my mortal life, my purpose is to leave unto them twain the realm, divided into two sundry parts. The one Ferex, mine elder son, shall have, the other shall the other, Horex. 
that both my purpose may more firmly stand and eke that they may better rule their charge, I mean forthwith to place them in the same, that in my life they may both learn to rule and I may joy to see their ruling well. This is the sum, what I would have you weigh. First, whether you allow my whole device and think it good for me, for them, for you, and for our country, mother to us all. And if ye like it and allow it well, then for their guiding and their governance, show forth such means of circumstance as ye think meet to be both known and kept. Lo, this is all. Now tell me your advice. And we'll just pause before we have the opportunity to see what, what advice. So the king's turned up and yeah, he definitely wants to split, split everything down the middle between the two sons. Um, he's, he set some things up with, um, we've, we got a setup of what Rostus seems to do, uh, which is, you know, uh, he tells, you know, the king, you know, we, um, we're, we're all your your noble ser ser servants and subjects and all uh, all that that sort of thing, and it's nice that we've got that because it 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 it, it lays us lays the groundwork for the response to this. I mean, does the court know this is coming? I mean, the queen did. Um, and what do we think of this 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 plan? Is it a good plan, people? <laughs> Any any thoughts? Any thoughts about what we've uh, the where we are in this scene? Uh, Ruth, are you still with us? By the way, just so yeah, I, I was having real connectivity issues. I kept losing the sound from people. Mm. Um, I don't know if other people have had that too. It must be just at my end. No, I was getting that problem no? too. So yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. well, anyway, so I've just switched off my video. Is that okay? I mean, yeah, I was... no, that's fine. We, well, we can see a picture of you, so uh, you know. Actually, it seems it seems a little bit better now. So. Mm. Um, no, this is definitely not a good plan. <laughs> no, well, it, it's something that turns up a lot, and I think we're we're allowed to mention uh, uh, the the earlier kings. I mean, this is this is you know, if we're going with Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, and Monmouth as a as a as a source and and all the other things based on that, um, you know, there are other kings available who do exactly the same thing. We have King Lear, who is an earlier king, who does exactly. The same thing so it's a theme that turns up a lot um and uh, we also have um you know the fact that you know okay it's been a while but there were those uh, those um those awkward wars we used to have um uh, to do with having potentially too many uh, potential successors to the throne uh, that caused quite a lot of chaos but luckily, all that was solved when those Tudors came in, so it's great. Um, <laughs> now, there is a narrative that this feeds into, especially if we think we've got the new queen on the throne, and um, maybe you want to throw a bit of history about why, why it's great to have a really um, firm dynasty in place. Um, so um, so how, how, how do we feel? Do we have a handle on Gorbadoc yet? Who is he? I, it could be too early. He takes a really long route towards telling his advisors his plan. Mm. So either he is a very kind king who really wants um, to make sure he's, he's properly understood as to how and why he's going to do it before he tells them what he's going to do. Or... I don't know. Is there another interpretation? Well, well, it's a question of, you know, how, you know, if he knows that no one's going to like it, then maybe he's not actually very confident in, in delivering it. Maybe there's a certain hesitancy. If he's a weak king, an older weak king, um, then, then maybe there's a certain hesitancy to this. Um, and and you know he's 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 almost tries to semi trap um, you know his his advisor into saying you know um, oh, of course we will do whatever you say my lord um, kind of thing I don't think he quite says that but um, maybe it's that sort of game going on um, you know because we've only got two speakers so far in this scene but you know we can assume that there's a wider court potentially around them 
um, and, and, and what are the personal dynamics as well as the dynastic di dynamics? Because the sons aren't in the room. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just going to, to further what you were saying, to what you were saying. Um, it's interesting that the, the language he uses is, it's not submissive exactly, but it's just one step removed from that. If mm. you like it and allow it well, then let's try and do that, is what he says to his advisors, as opposed to, you know, we have decreed and you all have to follow our tyrannical rule. Mm. Mm. I think there's uh, there's there's a lot there's there's a lot there to chew on. Okay, the court has had that. Let's see what the response is. So we've got a, a, a Restus, um response. And this is much, and asketh great advice. But for my part, my sovereign lord and king, this do I think your Majesty doth know. How under your justice and in peace, great wealth and honour long have we have enjoyed. So as we cannot seem with greedy minds to wish for change of prince and governance. But if ye like your purpose and device, our liking must be deemed to proceed of rightful reason and of heedful care. Not for ourselves, but for our common state. Sith our own state doth need no better change, I think, in all as erst your grace has said. First, when you shall unload your aged mind of heavy care and troubles manifold, and lay the same upon my lords your sons, whose growing years may hear the, they bear the burden long, and long I pray the gods grant it so. And in your life, why you shall so behold their rule, their virtues and their noble deeds, such as their kind behighteth to us all, great be the profits that shall grow thereof. Your age in quiet shall the longer last. Your lasting age shall be their longest stay for cares of kings that rule as you have ruled, for public wealth, not for private joy, to waste man's life and hasten crooked age with furrowed face and with enfeebled limbs to draw on creeping death a swifter pace. They too, yet young, shall bear the party reign with greater ease. And one now old alone can wield the whole, for whom much harder is with lessened strength and double weight to bear your eye, your counsel, and the grave regard of fathers, yea, of such as father's name. Now at beginning of their sundered reign, when it is hazard of their whole success, shall bridle so their force of youthful heats and so restrain the rage of insolence, which most assails the young and noble minds. And so shall guide and train in tempered stay their yet green bending wits with reverent awe, as now inured with virtues at the first, Custom, O king, shall bring delightfulness by use of virtue. By shall grow in hate, but if you so dispose it, that the day which ends your life shall first begin their reign, great is the peril. What will be the end when such beginning of such liberties, void of such stays as in your life do lie, shall leave them free to random of their will? an open prey to traitorous flattery, the greatest pestilence of noble youth, which peril shall be past if in your life their tempered youth with aged fathers or be brought in year of skillful staidness. And in your life, their lives disposed so shall lengthen your noble life in joyfulness. Thus, Think I that your grace hath wisely thought, and that your tender care of common weal hath bred this thought, so to divide your land and plant your sons to bear the present rule, while you yet live to see their ruling well, that you may longer live by joy therein. What further means behooveful are and meet? At greater leisure may your grace devise. When sea have said, and when we be agreed, if this be best, to part the realm in twain and place your sons in present government, whereof, as I have plainly said my mind, 
so would I hear the rest of all my lords. In part, I think, as has been said before, in part again, my mind is otherwise. As for dividing of this realm in twain, and lotting out the same in equal parts, to either of my lords, your grace's son, that think I best for this your realm's behoof, for profit and advancement of your sons, and for your comfort and your honour eke, but so to place them while your life do last, to yield to them your royal governance, to be above them only in the name of father, not in kingly state also. I think not good for you, for them, not us. This kingdom, since the bloody civil field, where Morgan slain did yield his conquered part unto his cousin's sword in Cumberland, containeth all that Willem did suffice, three noble sons of your forefather Brute, the mo the stronger, if they agree in one, the smaller compass that the realm doth hold, the easier is the sway thereof to weld, the nearest justice to the wronged poor, the smaller charge, and yet enough for one. And when the region is divided, so that brethren be the lords of either part, such strength does nature knit between the both, in sundry bodies by conjoined love, that not as two, but one of doubled force. Each is to other as a sure defence. The nobleness and glory of the one doth sharp the courage of the other's mind, with virtuous envy to contend for praise, and such an eagleness have nature made, between the brethren of one father's seed, as an unkind wrong it seems to be, to throw the other subject under feet of him, whose peer he is by course of kind, and nature that did make this eagleness, oft so repenteth at so great a wrong that oft she raises by a grudging grief in younger brethren at the elder's state, whereby both towns and kingdoms have been raised and famous stocks of royal blood destroyed. The brother that should be the brother's aid and have a wakeful care for his defence, gapes for his death and blames the lingering years that brings not forth his end with faster course and oft impatient of long delays. With hateful slaughter he prevents the fates and heaps a just reward for brother's blood, with endless vengeance on his stock for I. Such mischiefs here are wisely met withal. If Egar's state may nourish Egar love, where none have cause to grudge the other's good, but now the head to stoop beneath them both, nay kind, nay reason, nay all, nay good order beers. And oft it hath been seen that when nature hath been perverted in disorder wise, when fathers cease to know that they should rule, and children cease to know that they should obey, and often are unkindly tenderness. Is mother of unkindly stubbornness? I speak this not in envy or uh, in reproach, as if I grudged the glory of your sons whose honour I beseech the gods to increase, nor yet as if I thought there did remain, so filthy cankers in their noble breasts, whom I esteem, which is their greatest praise, undoubted children of so good a king. Only I mean to show my certain rules, which kind have graft within the, man, the mind of man, that nature hath her order and her course, which being broken, both corrupt the state of minds and things, even in the best of all. My lords, your sons may learn to rule of you, your own example in your noble court, its fittest guider of their youthful years. If you desire to seek some present joy by sight of their well-ruling in your life, see them obey, so shall you see them rule. Whoso obeyeth not with humbleness will rule with outrage and insolence. Long may, may they rule, I do beseech the gods. But long may they learn ere they begin to rule. If kind and fates would suffer, I would wish them aged princes and immortal kings. Wherefore, most noble king, I well assent between your sons that you divide your realm. 
and as in kind, so match them in degree. But while the gods prolong your royal life, prolong your reign, for there to live you here, and therefore have the gods so long forborn to join you to themselves, that still you might be prince and father of our common weal. They, when they see your children ripe to rule, will make them room and will remove you hence, that yours in right ensuing of your life may rightly honour your mortal name. Your wanted true regard of faithful hearts makes me, O oh king, the bolder to presume to speak what I conceive within my breast. Although the same do not agree at all with that which other here my lords have said, nor which yourself have seen best to like, pardon I crave, and that my words be deemed to flow from hearty zeal unto your grace, and the safety of your common weal. To part your realm unto my lords, your sons, I think not good for you, nay, yet for them, but worst of all for this our native land. For with one land, one single rule is best. Divided reigns do make divided hearts, but peace preserves the country and the prince. Such is in man the greedy mind to reign, so great is his desire to climb aloft, in worldly stage the stateliest parts to bear, that faith and justice and all kindly love do yield unto the desire of sovereignty. Where eagle st Egal state doth raise an egal hope to win the thing that either would attain. Your grace remembereth how in past years the mighty Brute, first prince of this or this land, possessed the same and ruled it well in one. He thinking that the compass did, compass did suffice for his three sons, three kingdoms eke to make, cut it in three, as you now would now in twain. But how much British blood had citizens been split to join against the sundered unity? What princes slain before their timely hour? What waste of towns and people in the land? What treasons heaped on murders and spoils? Whose just revenge even yet is scarcely, scarcely ceased? Ruthful remembrances yet had in mind. Oh, the gods forbid the like to chance again, and you, O king, give not the cause thereof. My lord Ferex, your elder son, perhaps, whom kind and custom gives a rightful hope to be your heir and to succeed your reign, shall think that he doth suffer greater wrong than he perchance will bear if power serve. Porex, the younger, so upraised in state, perhaps in courage will be raised also, if flattery then, which falls not to assail the tender minds of yet unskilful youth, one should kindle an increased disdain, and envy in the other hearts, other's heart in flame. This fire shall waste their love, their lives, their land, and ruth or ruin shall destroy them both. Oh, I wish not this, O oh king, so to befall, but fear the thing that I do most abhor, give no beginning to so dreadful end. Keep them in order and obedience. And let them both by now obeying you and such behaviour as beseems their state. The older mildness in his governance, the younger a yielding countenance. And keep them there unto your presence still, that they, restrained by the awe of you, may live in compass of well tempered stay and pass the perils of their youthful years. Your age life draws on to feeble as high wherein you shall less by be able to hear the travails that in youth you have sustained both in your persons and your realm's defence if planting now your sons in further parts you send them further from your present reach less shall you know how they themselves demean traitorous corruptors of their pliant you shall have unspied a much more free access and if ambition and inflamed disdain shall arm the one the other or them both to civil war or to usurping pride, late shall you rue that you nay wrecked before. Good is, I grant, of all the hope to the best, but not to live still dreadless of the worst, and trust the one that the other be foreseen, arm not unskilfulness with princely power, but you that 
long have wisely ruled the reins of royalty within your noble realm. So hold them while the gods for our avail shall stretch the thread of your prolonged days. Too soon he climbed into the flaming cart whose want of skill did set the earth on fire. Time and example of your noble grace shall teach your sons both to obey and rule. When time hath taught them, time shall make them. The place that now is full, and so I pray long it remain, to comfort of us all. Okay, we've got three responses to the king's suggestion there. Um, and I was sort of expecting it to go, yes, yes, but wait. And then the final one, no, 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 dear God, no. But the final one isn't really no, no, dear God, no. It's sort of... No. It's it's more negative, but it's it's not quite as as absolute as I was sort of expecting it to go, um, and it's that question of are you try is this councillors trying to nudge the king rather than to go directly against the king's wishes? Is that the game that's happening here? Uh, you've got these three people; they're presumably also playing their own power games between each other. Uh, who are they? Um, thoughts from the room. I think it's clear there's some kind of tactical game going on mm. here for sure. Um, that they're, yeah, it's weird. It's like, um, it's like ego against ego, but at the same time, that it's almost like a sense of manipulation from all three of them. Um, but they don't directly say to the king, Oh, you, you can, you, you must do this. You must do that. Yes. We're all for it. It's more like this wonderful Oh, how can I how can I class it? It's almost like a sense of entrapment. You know, when you set something up in a really dramatic way in order to hook somebody in, and then all of a sudden you kind of finish it on a note so that the person you're trying to reel in thinks it's their idea. Mm. I've it's almost like all three speeches have got that similar inclination going on there that it's like all three are working together but they're also working against each other but it's all for the one same purpose to get the king on um you know, on their side so to speak yeah, put them all together and it's a very long journey from yes that's great to please don't um <laughs> yeah. via i've i've made a, a note because I found it interesting. The first servant, uh, sorry, the first advisor says, yes, it's a great idea to divide your kingdom and it's a great idea to do it now. Mm. The second one says, divide it, but not now. And the yeah. third one says, could you not mm. divide it? Mm. So they're, not only are they building um, from, from one to the next, but they are almost kind of um, structuring their speeches in exactly the same way. Mm. Well, well, is is that they're sort of seeding elements um, uh, within the speech when they're sort of going yes um, you know they, they they keep mentioning bloody civil war and things but not necessarily at the point when they're saying that you know doing this will lead to a civil war um, they'll just say that's a that's a thing that's in the room at the moment just yeah. mentioning that while I'm talking about something else and then we'll we'll <laughs> we'll get to it you know these are bad things that could happen. Your king's absolutely right in, in all the things you're thinking, uh, but there, there's some death that might happen. Um, and it seems that there's, a, there's almost a deliberate disconnect of seeding the thought without necessarily directly saying, don't do this. Because I didn't find the final counselor directly ever said, don't do this. It's just there, layered in. Um, I thought with... Um... Uberness. It, the, the, I love his own kings when they come. That sort of pleading, but also sort of slightly deferential, but in a very sort of um, sarcastic way, almost. At least that's how it it read to me. But I I really got into that and thinking, all right, I'm going to tell him not to do it in the end. And by the time I got to the end of the speech, I was going. Okay, He's not saying what I thought he'd say. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's like he chickens out, um, yeah. and he, he doesn't he doesn't quite say it. And maybe that's 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 part of the message here: is your counsellors have to tell you the truth, and they yeah, de they but, dent, perhaps. Mm, mm. But is that oh. then the hook line of the manipulation part of that? Because you do hear about um, counsellors actually 
having more power over the king in fairy tales. And it actually reminded me very much of um, Aladdin, the Arabian Nights. Um, when, you know, if we take the Disney version, for example, you've got Jafar who's, you know, corrupting the, the Sultan into his way of thinking, but not overtly saying the true intentions. Um, especially on that, um, on that second speech, I think. It's very Jafar-esque in the sense, well, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, wait for a little bit. But it's almost like, like I say, between all three of them, there is a form of, yeah, like you say, Robert, that seed to make sure that the king actually thinks it's his own, it's his own decision in the end. Mm. Um, it's a form of manipulation, which you do see, like I say, a lot in things like Aladdin, Grimm's fairy tales, the works. There's a well, lot of that going on. The, there is a slight difference here. I, I, I don't think it works. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, so maybe the message no. is it. Maybe the message is less that you know you can nudge and manipulate the king. It's more if you did if you'd actually said to the king, no, that that might have been better. <laughs> Ruth, uh, you wanted to say something. Well, I'm just I'm very struck by how long these speeches are, and just in terms of the stagecraft. I'm wondering what's going on here. I don't think I've ever come across in any early modern drama such long set pieces. Uh, it's just incredible. And I'm to, I, some of this has the feel to me a, a little bit of, rather than a court of a kind of court of law, mm. where they're actually getting up and making these kind of long set speeches that actually aren't very clear. <laughs> but well. I just... What do other people make of how long the speeches are? Mm. It, it, it is very long, though, and I have to admit, you know, although I love the writing in this, I did kind of think at one point, come on, guys, just get to the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like the mm. writing too, Sasha. I think the writing's very clever. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, I think this is the good point to jump in, that this is uh, by the gentleman in the in inner temple. So when we're talking about law... Um, <laughs> You know, cool. this is in part an exercise in their oratory. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I, I think I said this before we went uh, to record, you know, we, 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 we're going to have to take as read that there's going to be a lot of long speeches uh, in, this, is, in this text. Uh, the question is, can we make these speeches dynamic in a staging fashion? Um, or could they be adjusted um, for, uh, for a modern audience? You know, is, are there obvious? I don't think there are obvious cutting points, but there might be a way of mixing them because they do yes. dance around similar yeah. ideas from each other that maybe they could actually, we could, with a bit of jiggery pokery, um, cut into each other's argument um, mm. in a much more dynamic way. I don't know if that would work. Uh, it's it's one of those ideas that sounds great on paper and then dies in your it, hands in a workshop. Uh, it could do. And actually, just thinking about that, you know, now my head's going into overdrive. You could also, if you wanted to, I was just having a listen to that and I kept thinking, what if there was a chorus aspect to it? So some of the speeches were said at the same time by all three so that they're like one unit to show that they're coming together, possibly. Mm before they then go into their own little separate bits? I, I think there is almost, you know, it's that question. Are the courtiers, or, or do they each have an individual opinion and they are expressing their individual opinion and the king can choose between them? Or are they all pushing him towards the final speech? And, and that's, a, that's a question that I, I don't have an answer for. I think that's a production's question. And I would like to add a question to that, which is, um, you know, you were saying earlier, um, if they... If they had just, if they were to just go ahead and say it, you know, we all think this is a bad idea, Your Majesty. Well, one, the play would be a lot shorter. Um, but <laughs> two, I wonder whether the target of these speeches and therefore the reason for the delicacy is not Gorbadek; it's the Queen. Oh, um, oh so whether good. that is, you know, people who don't have a very high position, who don't necessarily have anything to fall back on if they upset her, going, um, have you thought about succession? Because um, the ideas that are currently being vehiculated, um, they're bad. And we can't tell you, you know, 
this would be a very stupid thing to do. So instead, we're going to go a really, really roundabout way to kind of seed, as you were saying, as, as um, you guys have mentioned before, seed that idea into your head and make you think that you thought of it. Mm. I, I think we'll pause there for the moment. I think that we can, we can, there's a lot here more we can, we can dive, but, uh, delve into. But I think, especially as we've mentioned a chorus, I think we should rattle to the end of this scene because there is only a little bit more. So the advisors have all spoken to the king. Let's hear what the king thought of their speeches. I take your faithful hearts in a thankful part. But, since I see no cause to draw my mind to fear the nature of my loving sons, or to misdeem that envy or disdain can their work hate where nature planteth love, in one self-purpose do I still abide. My love extendeth eagerly to both, my land sufficeth for them both also. Humber shall part the marches of their realms, the southern part the eldest shall possess, the northern shall porex the younger. In quiet I will pass mine aged days, free from the travail and the painful cares that hasten age upon the worthiest kings. But lest the fraud that ye do seem to fear of flattering tongue corrupt their tender youth and writhe them to the ways of youthful lust, to climbing pride or to revenging hate or to neglecting of their carefree charge, lewdly to live in wanton recklessness or to oppressing of the rightful cause or not to wreak the wrongs done to the poor, to tread down truth or favour false deceit. I mean to join either of my sons, some one of those whose long approved faith and wisdom tried may well assure my heart that mining fraud shall find no way to creep into their fenced ears with grave advice. This is the end, and so I pray you all to bear my sons the love and loyalty that I have found within your faithful breasts. You nor your sons, our sovereign lord, shall want our faith and service while our lives do last. So he's setting up an apprentice scheme uh, for his his sons uh, with a couple of advisor, a couple, an advisor each. But basically, he just ignored you. Yeah. <laughs> he just he ran rather, didn't he? <laughs> straight through you. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you can call upon Brutus and the, the, the first king of the Britons and you can call on <laughs> the examples of the past and none of it worked. None of it worked. You should have just said, it's a no from us. That's, that's <laughs> all you needed to say. Um, okay, the scene ends, or the act ends with a chorus. So, Greg, could you give us the chorus? When settled state doth hold the royal throne, in steadfast place by known and doubtless right, and chiefly when dissent on one alone makes single and imparted reign to light, each change of course and drinks the whole estate, and yields it throughout to ruin by debate, the strength that knit by fast accord in one against all foreign powers, power of mighty foes, could of itself defend itself alone, disjoined once the former force doth lose the sticks that sundered break so soon in twain in faggot bound attempted were in vain of tender mind that leads the partial eye of erring parents in their children's love destroys the wrongly loved child thereby this doth the proud son of apollo prove who rashly set in the chariot of his sire inflamed the parched earth with heaven's fire and this great king that doth divide his land and change the course of his descending crown and yields the reign into his children's hand for a blissful state of joy and great renown. A mirror shall become to princes all to learn to shun the cause of such a fall. So the chorus brings us full circle to the dumb show at the beginning, uh, filling that in. Um, Debates ruin everything. Um, he doesn't quite say that, but he sort of says that. 
the king should the kingdom and the king should go with one direction um the debate was pointless i think i'm overstating that but um there's 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 some interesting things there um so that's act one thoughts of act one before we move into act two there's another dumb show to come just two things from my speech which i've really interesting because apparently he's the secretary to the king I did feel like the historian caught historian in that speech it was very interesting go back to Brute etc mm. there was one word I was I read it and I was going what the heck is it um, which is what it, it's on the script as I think sisense or sisence but how much the how much British blood had sisense been split had uh, since uh, yes yeah, since so yeah so it would it would be since yeah oh, since, be since. that's fine it's just reading it I was yeah confused. well it's it's quite a it's quite a you know that it's it really is calling on you know it, it's been going on since the beginning since the yeah. first ruler um and and all the various following kings have all been besieged by this problem of of succession and and unity and you know you're doing it again. Okay. Which would have been interesting for Elizabeth anyway. Mm. Mm. The question of succession. Mm. Not quite as urgent at this point, but it, it's, it, it will build as time goes on. I'm wondering where this is going in terms of sort of psychological realism, because it feels, it felt to me as if Gorbodok didn't have very strong motivation for what he was doing, other than that he wants to take early retirement. <laughs> and that just doesn't seem to be a very good reason reason for why he wants to do this and 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 it seems to me that what the play is more interested in is setting up something where you feel that that this where you feel that there's going to be this these awful deaths are going to take place and there's going to be all kinds of vengeance and so on but it, it just doesn't seem terribly well motivated to me I, I I don't know if I wholly agree. I I think there is a there's a it's it's not clearly stated. I think there's a lot to mine in Gorbadoc himself. Um, I think we're also possibly biased because we, we, you know, we've advertised it as Gorbadoc is the title of the play, but as I said the other title is it's Ferrix and Pollux, and that he's actually possibly not very important. Um, it, it's it is difficult to tell what precisely to do with him, but I think there are options. Um, I, I, I think you're you're. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely disagreeing with you. I think you're right. He's not given a motivation for this. Um, it's the situation that's more important than, than yeah. why it's happening. Yeah, it's um, not the situation that will cause the fall. Mm, mm. Yeah, because similarly, the advisors are not contoured as full people. They're just, you know, the vehicle for each of the speeches right. at this point in time. Yeah, uh, I, again, I, I took up to a point. Um, I, I think there, there is, I think when we, if you mind it, I think that, that there's <laughs> yeah. definitely more there. Uh, but you're right. Again, there's not, there's, there isn't a, the the argument is the thing, not the character, isn't it? Right. But uh, but I also wondered whether the the names are at all meaningful. You know, but then they don't actually say what each of, what they're called, do they? Or people have... are blessing them. So, Philander looks like you know, lover boy. Mm. And, you know, I just don't know whether they're meant to be symbolic. Doesn't Arostas mean roasted? Mm. or something like that but they yeah. don't seem then they don't call each other by it there isn't a great deal made of the symbolism of the names no the only the only named characters that we have are the central figures who are um okay. you know the title characters yeah. that everybody else is 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 there for set dressing and uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um okay we need to rattle into uh the first scene of act two we've got the dumb show first so let's Let's find out what the next bit of musical spectacle will be. Pardon me. First, the music of cornets began to play, during which came in upon the stage a king, accompanied with a number of his nobility and gentlemen. And after he had placed himself in a chair of estate prepared for him, there came and kneeled before him a grave and aged gentleman and offered up a cup unto him of wine in a glass which the king refused. After him comes a brave and lusty young gentleman and presents the king with a cup of gold filled with potion, which the king accepted. And drinking the same, 
immediately fell down dead upon the stage and so was carried thence away by his lords and gentlemen. And then the music ceased. Hereby was signified that as glass by nature holdeth no poison, but is clear and may easily be seen through, nay boweth by any art, so a faithful counsellor holdeth no treason, but is plain and open, nay yieldeth to any undiscreet affection, but giveth wholesome counsel, which the ill-advised prince refuseth. The delightful gold filled with poison betokeneth flattery, which under fair seeming of pleasant words beareth deadly poison, which destroyeth the prince that receiveth it. As befell in the two brethren, Ferrix and Porrex, who, refusing the wholesome advice of grave court fellows, credited these young parasites and brought to themselves death and destruction thereby. And that's the, the setup. Of course, the audience wouldn't get the signification. Um, and actually, that as an image is a much less clear one yeah. to be presented with, because depending on how you present Gorbatok himself, you might think, oh, is Gorbatok dead now? Um, you know, you might feel that that's telling your story rather than being symbolic. Um, the music is cornets rather than vi viols or violins or whatever it was, uh, but, uh, violins before. So we got a different, more pompy kind of music playing. Um, I mean, it will get explained presumably in the chorus at the end of the act, but, um, you know, by that point, we might all be a bit confused as to what's going on. Um, <laughs> Because it's not literal plot, and that's that that that's dangerous. I think I feel. Thoughts about that one? Nobody, no, no, nobody wants to comment on the dumb shows. So what's happening here is the guy is giving like a guide, but the, but the dumb show is actually going on behind him. Is it, or is the dumb show doing the dumb show? Well, th this is just a descriptor. I mean, you know, none of this text would be spoken. Um, I think this is just for the printed audience at home. Oh, right, I see. I thought it was someone coming in while the people were acting. Okay, so this really is stage direction. Yeah, and it's the fact we get the signification. We get the explanation of what's going on. I, you know, the audience won't get that until the chorus. They won't get it just from a dumb show. No, I mean, it's, it's it, you know, whereas the first dumb show is quite clear uh, yeah. as, a, as, a, as, a, as an action. That's really straightforward. This one could be read so many different ways, um, and say the, the the audience isn't getting that data, um, and it's one of those questions as an audio company as well of just going, what do we do with the dumb shows? What do we do with the visual scenes? <laughs> um, as well as if we stage it live. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's that's an interesting one. That's a, a little bit of art creeping in there, um, rather than entertainment, shall we say. Uh, okay, let's do the first scene of Act 2. That's uh, what we're down to do today, and I think that's pretty much all we'll have time to do before we, we wrap up. So Act 2, Scene 1, we have Ferex. We haven't met him yet, has he? It's the other brother, isn't it? Have we met? Uh, oh, no, we did. We met him earlier. This is the same one from Act 1. So Ferex, Hermon, and Dordan. And Ferex speaks first. I marvel much what reason led the king my father thus without all desert to reave me half the kingdom which by course of law and nature should remain to me. If you with stubborn and untamed pride had stood against him in rebelling wise, or if with grudging mind you had envied so slow a sliding of his aging years, or fought before your time to haste the course of fatal death upon his royal head, or stained your stock with murder of your kin, some face of reason might perhaps have seemed to yield some likely cause to spoil ye thus. The reekful gods pour on my cursed head eternal plagues and never dying woes. A hellish prince and judge my damned ghost to Tantalus thirst or proud Ixion's wheel, or cruel gripe to gnaw my growing heart to during torments and unquenched flames. If ever I concern so foul a thought to wish his end of life or yet of reign, 
Nay, yet your father, O oh, most noble prince, did ever think so foul a thing of you, for he with more than father's tender love, while yet the fates do lend him life to rule, who long might live to see your ruling well, to you, my lord, and to his other son, lo, he resigns his realm and royalty, which never would so wise a prince have done if he had once misdeemed that in your heart there ever lodged, lodged so unkind a thought. But tender love, my lord, and settled trust of your good nature and your noble mind made him to place you thus in royal throne, and now to give you half his realm to guide. Yea, and that half with an abounding store of things that serve to make a wealthy realm, in stately cities and in fruitful soil, in temperate breathing of the milder heaven, in things of needful use, which friendly sea transports by traffic from the foreign ports, in flowing wealth, in honour, and in force, doth pass the double, the double value of part that Porex hath allotted to his reign, such is your case, such is your father's love. Ah, love, my friends, love wrongs not whom he loves. Ne yet wrongeth you that giveth you so large a reign, ere that the course of time bring you to kingdom by descended right, which time perhaps might end your time before. Is this no wrong, say you, to reave from me my native right of half so great a realm, and thus to match his younger son with me in equal power and in as great a degree? Yea, and what son, a son whose swelling pride would never yield one point of reverence when I, the elder and apparent heir, stood in the likelihood to possess the whole? Yea, and that son which from his childish age envieth my honour and doth hate my life, what will he do now do when his pride, his rage, the mindful malice of his grudging heart is armed with force, with wealth and kingly state? Was this not wrong? Yea, ill-advised wrong to give so mad a man so sharp a sword to so great peril of so great mishap, wide open thus to set so large a way. Alas, my lord, what griefful thing is this, that of your brother you can think so ill? I never saw him utter likely sign whereby a man might see or once misdeem such hate of you, nay such unyielding pride. Ill is their counsel, shameful be their end, that raising such mistrustful fear in you, sowing the seed of such unkindly hate, travail by reason to destroy you both. Wise is your brother, and of noble hope, worthy to wield a large and mighty realm. So much a stronger friend have you thereby, whose strength is your strength, if you agree in one. I'm just, gonna pa I'm just gonna pause there because uh, you're about to go into a big speech um, uh -huh. <laughs> um so ferex uh do we recognize ferex from the first scene uh not really no 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 the characterization seems different there he was all kind of full of blandishments for his mother and care for his mother and now here he is absolutely overwhelmed by hey my birthright's been taken away from me so it it's feels very it's a big jarring thing mm. it, it it is and you know we can assume that time has passed or you know we can we can we can interpolate things but it is a it's just a totally different person yeah, we're playing a similar game though in terms of what the scene is doing in terms of uh slightly different advisors around you know what do we do now what do we do now um you know should you love your brother or should you get rid of your brother um and uh, and uh, who who would you know does he listen to advice or good advice or bad advice so um you know act two's do playing similar games but with different characters um and so hermon and Dord uh, dordan uh what have we got from them so far though those who were reading them right hermon is very very outspoken, um, as opposed to Dordan. 
Um, I think, um, you, you, you know, I mean, Herman is the, I would say from some of the things that he's saying, um, is more the action person rather than the thinking through and everything else. But he, he's very impulsive because even um, in that little bit when he, um, when Dorden calls him out about how he views, um, you, you know, how, how he views the, the other person in question, which is um, his father. You know, he's quite blatant about it. I mean, yes, yay, ill advised wrong to give so mad a man so sharp a sword. I mean, ouch. <laughs> it, it's like, it, seriously, it's like he's, you know, he's not afraid to speak his mind um, mm. as a person. Um, hoping it will galvanize this young prince into action or um, oh really if only you'd have done this if, it, if you'd have rebelled we would have gotten into this we would have gotten into a different situation you know that kind of thing we've, we've got a, hawk, to... a bit of a hawk and a dove really here haven't we oh uh, yeah um <laughs> uh, is that fair is that right to say about um uh, so, uh, uh, uh what, what about uh D D Dorden? Yeah, he's he's he seems to be at least so far very much a peacekeeper and a um, supporter of everyone in a sort of way. You know, a, a, let's just a, the sort of person who would go, oh, just let's just talk about this and you know, tell me how you feel and let's sort it out that way. Um, because he he keeps bringing up. Um, the kindness, the the um, not just in positive features in general, but things to do with. I'm I'm looking for uh, examples here, of you know your father loves you, your brother is worthy. Uh, you know they're all good people. Mm, mm. It's yeah. not just don't fight because that would be a bad idea or because you you wouldn't win. Mm. It's let's all be friends. Yes. Um, and we've gone from a situation where we had three advisors giving advice. Now we have two advisors and it's like there's, there's a, almost a tell us, you know, the, uh, the, the options are narrowing down perhaps um, as we move forward, as crisis increases. But I agree that they're both more direct. I think it's it's not as obvious in uh, Dorden because he's not sort of uh, encouraging mm. him towards action, but he's definitely speaking his mind very directly. Yeah, to yeah. The young prince, which is uh, totally yeah, the just, opposite of the he, three we at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. He just chooses to phrase it in a very different way, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the big, another lovely, lovely chunky speech. Uh, enjoy yourself. <laughs> Take your time. There's no hurry. We have time. We haven't got that much text left to do. <laughs> you you have a lot of text to do, but we as a totality don't have a lot of text. To do. <laughs> Well, it's fine. It's all good. If nature and the gods had pinched so their flowing bounty and their noble gifts of princely qualities from you, my lord, and poured them all at once in wasteful wise upon your father's younger son alone, perhaps there be that in your prejudice would say that birth should yield to worthiness. But sith in each good gift and princely act, ye are his match. And in the thief, the chief of all, in mildness and in sober governance, ye far surmount. And if there is in you sufficing skill and hopeful towards this to wield the whole and match your elders' praise, I see no cause why ye should lose the half. Nay would I with you yield to such a loss, lest your mild sufferance of so great a wrong be deemed cowardice and simple dread which shall give courage to the fiery head of your younger brother to invade the whole, whilst yet fearful sticks in the people's minds the loathed wrong of your disinheritance. And ere your brother have by settled power, by guileful cloak of an alluring show, got him some force and favour in this realm, and while the noble queen, your mother, lives, to work and practice all for your avail, attempt redress by arms, and wreak yourselves upon his life, that gaineth by your loss, who now to shame of you and grieve of us in your own kingdom, triumphs over you. 
Show now your courage. Meet the kingly estate that they which have avowed to spend their goods, their lands, their lives and honours in your cause may be the bolder to maintain your part when they do see that coward fear in you shall not betray ne fell they ne fail their faithful hearts if once the death of porrex end the strife and pay the price of his usurped reign your mother shall persuade the angry king the lords your friends eke shall appeal his rage for they be wise and well they can foresee that ere long time your aged father's death will bring a time when you shall well requite their friendly favour or their hateful spite yea all their slackness to advance your cause wise men do not so hang on passing state of present princes chiefly in their age but they will further cast their reaching eye to view and weigh the times and reigns to come nay is it likely though the king be rough that he yet will or that the realm will bear extreme revenge upon his only son or if he would what one is he that dare be minister to such an enterprise and here you be now placed in your own amid your friends your vassals and your strength we shall defend and keep your person safe till either counsel turn his tender mind or age or sorrow end his weary days but if the fear of gods and secret grudge of nature's law repining at the fact withhold your courage on so great attempt know ye that lust of kingdoms hath no law the gods do bear and well allow in kings the things they are bore in rascal routs when kings on slender quarrels run to wars and then in cruel and unkindly wise command thefts rapes murders of innocence to spoil of towns and reigns of mighty realms think you such princes do oppress themselves no think you such princes do suppress themselves subject to laws of kind and fear of gods yet none offence but decked with glorious name of global conquest in the hands of kings murders and violent thefts in private men are heinous crimes and full of foul reproach but if you like not yet so hot devise nay list to take such vantage of the time but though with great peril of your state you will not be the first that shall invade assemble yet your force for your defence and for your safety stand upon your guard oh heaven was there ever heard or known so wicked counsel to a noble prince let me my lord disclose unto your grace this heinous tale what mischief it contains your father's death your brothers and your own your present murder and eternal shame hear me o oh king and suffer not to sink so high a treason in your princely breast a mighty gods forbid that ever i should once conceive such mischief in my heart although my brother has bereft my realm and bear perhaps to me an hateful mind shall i revenge it with his death therefore or shall I so destroy my father's life that gave me life? The gods forbid, I say, cease you to speak so any more to me. Nay, you, my friend, with answer once repeat so foul a tale. In silence let it die. What lord or subject shall have hope at all that under me they safely shall enjoy their goods, their honours, lands and liberties, with whom neither one only brother bears? Nay, father dearer could enjoy their lives. But sith, I fear, but sith I fear my younger brother's rage, and sith perhaps some other man may give some like advice to move his grudging head at mine estate, which counsel may perchance take greater force with him than this with me, I will in secret so prepare myself, as if his malice of his lust to reign break forth with arms or sudden violence, I may withstand his rage and keep mine own. I fear the fatal Ooh, time yeah, just pause it. I'm just going to pause you there. I'm going to pause you there. We're not going to quite finish the scene. Um, well, that escalated quickly. Um, 
just I mean, a bit. It's it's mutually assured destruction a bit, isn't it? It's uh, it is that thing of well, you know, I may. It may be fine, but I can't trust that my brother isn't preparing to murder me, so I'm going to have to prepare to murder him. Um, and it's just... Um, the, the, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. The, 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 the text, I don't know if you have it in yours, um, certain passages here are marked, uh, and the notation I have here, they were used to mark an inf a particularly emphatic or sententious passage. Uh, so there are parts in the script which are obviously designed for you to really, um, uh, for Hermann to really go for it and really rattle, because he really does go for it, doesn't he? I mean, that speech actually rattles along in a way he, that the ones does. in Act Ones do don't. No. Yeah, I don't have any stage direction in my script apart from the speech itself but yeah. even so reading that even if you didn't have the stage directions you can plainly see he's out for blood mm. and it's enough to I, I mean depending on which way a director would do this depending on how far that director would want the actor playing um, her mom to go you mean you know you could just by the structure of it I'm, I've, I was deliberately holding back a little bit here but just from that reading, you could take it to the umph degree, but you'd also have to kind of bring it back. So there has to be a balance somewhere if you were to do this for real. Mm. Um, and, you know, and it provokes an almost equal but opposite reaction, although a much shorter one from, uh, 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 from uh, Dor Dor Dorden as well. Um, you know that that's a very emphatic response, um, and you know it's like Ferrex goes, no, uh, 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 <laughs> just like wait. <laughs> yeah, um, and he does talk through his options quite slowly, and the you know, um, in silence, let it die. I think that's a lovely, mm. lovely line, um, and that seems a much slower speech. Is that he's really thinking it out. As, as he makes his decision. Um, so we've got two scenes. We've had two scenes of decision-making. Um, you know, not necessarily good decision-making, but we've got decision-making going on. Um, uh, I mean, that's that, again, Act One opened with a very dynamic sp uh, scene, or, you know, a, a short but really quite punchy scene. Act Two's opening with another sh quite short um, okay, you know, that speech is relatively long in real terms, but it's not long in terms of how you perform it. I think that's moving fast. Mm. I don't think we're hanging mm. about on any of those, those notes. Um, no, definitely not. If, you know, the only point in the scene where I think we, we, we do pull it back is, uh, Ferrex's and then for, for Dorden's final speech we're about to have now. Um, before we go into the, the opposing team, which we're not quite going to have time to do today, so we will definitely stay on schedule. Um, so, yes, Dorton um, closes, closes this scene. Everybody else has exited, exit Ferrix and Herm, uh, Hermon. I fear the fatal time now draweth on when civil rage shall end the noble line of famous brute and of his royal seed. Great Jove, defend the mischiefs now at hand. Oh, that the secretary's, secretary's wise advice had erst been heard when he besought the king not to divide his land, nor send his sons to further parts from presence of his court, nor yet to yield to them his governance. Lo, such as they now in the royal throne. Lo, such are they now in the royal throne, as was rash Phaeton in Phoebus' car. Nay, yet, nay, then the fiery steeds did draw the flame with wilder random through the kindled skies. Then traitorous counsel now will whirl about the youthful heads of these unskillful knights. But I. Hereof their father will inform. The reverence of him perhaps shall stay the growing mischiefs while they are yet green. If this helps not, then woe unto themselves, the prince, the people, the divided land. And he exits and the scene ends. 
I think it's really telling that you you talk of the um, the secretary's wise advice from from Act One. Um, uh, he whose name is too fiddly to pronounce, um, but whose name has never been pronounced. <laughs> the only thing that's been said about him is that he's the secretary. And would the audience get which one was the secretary from Act One uh, from that piece of information? I don't um, think they would, because he's the only one with the wise advice. Mm, oh, yeah, I think that's that. Um, yeah, but which was the wise Titan's advice? Titan's car was mentioned. Wasn't yeah. It? Mm. So. You know, you know it's, uh, that, that's an interesting uh, point because he will, I believe, return. So um, it, uh, you're talking about a character who will turn up again, which is uh, a point because neither Ferex nor Herman, I think, uh, not Ferex, uh, neither Herman nor uh, Dordan, I think, ever appear again. I don't think you ever see them again. I, I, I could be wrong. I may have missed them. Um, but I, I, I think they are done with. Uh, we will see the councillors generally. Uh, they, I think, will return. Philander will return later. Um, and um, and yes, the councillor returns uh, later in, I think, this act. I think he appears again in the next scene. Um, but there is an interesting question about, you know, is there any point getting attached to any of these characters? Because Game of Thrones style... Many of them will not make it, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, we, I read the argument at the beginning, so you should know exactly who's going to die. Um, <laughs> and in what approximate order. <laughs> I go back to my horror movie comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, we were talking about mutually assured destruction, but I was part of me was thinking that whole thing feels like a war room and, you know, not a slow PowerPoint presentation, but I feel that there should be projected <laughs> images of, you know, the, the defense capabilities of the, 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 the enemy strongholds and, and, and things there. Mm. Um, you know, that there is stuff to make, you know, as I said, as I said at the top, you know, this is played mostly constructed as speeches, um, but that doesn't mean we can't make the most of it and turn it into a, a more dynamic uh, piece for a modern audience. Um, you know, and to trust some of the speeches, because obviously we do, we're looking at this for the first time. Um, we should note that there are some issues with the uh, with the text that we're reading. Um, uh, and I wonder if there are variations in the text as well. Cause some of the word choices that I'm hearing are very different to the ones I'm seeing. And it's not like the typos. They, they seem to be different word choices. So I'm going to look into that for tomorrow. Uh, that's a little bit of homework for me. Nothing that has derailed anything. Uh, particularly, but there's occasional word choices where I'm going, that's clearly totally different. Um, um, we had a little burst of classical sources, but we haven't had that much classical uh, stuff thrown in there. We had, uh, you know, we've had a lot of British history um, uh, and uh, there, there was a, there was a, there was a burst somewhere. Oh, Tantalus and uh, etc. And uh, Satan. Yeah, Satan. as well. Yeah, they keep yeah. returning to that. I think it's been mentioned as a as a story, not necessarily by name, but it's been mentioned as a as a um, storyline in each of the scenes so far, except for the very first one. Mm. Yeah. Yes, when you 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 pick your classical references and you keep them quite tight. I mean, uh, there there are some that turn up a lot in plays just simply because they seem to be the repertoire that they expect people to know, even if they don't have a classical education. Um, uh, the other point to remember is that yes, we've spent um, you know hour and a half uh, looking at this first act in a bit, uh, but the play itself, in terms of words, is not very long. Uh, it's not excessively long. You know, you could make it last two hours. You could make it last much longer. You shouldn't. You you have to work very hard to make it last longer. I mean, I I think with a few trims and a, a decent pacing, you can get it down to ninety minutes perfectly happily. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that's where I think it should live. Um, uh, and you know, it, I, I, you know, I, I, yes, there are a lot of long speeches, and the, there is a certain lack of consistency with the the one character who is recurred. But um, it it does seem to be functioning very well um, mm. on the whole. Yeah. Uh, it's raising lots of questions that I think we won't be able to answer until the end of the week. Um, Spare the rods, uh, spoil the kingdom, um, as a note I wrote randomly at one point, because they were talking about it like, we've, t we've had these um, disobedient children in other plays that we've done quite recently, 
and it seems to be the same message um and that i found really interesting um um and these counselors to porex are they i'm just checking if there's a note saying uh are they down as parasites um oh no dorden is a counselor hermon is d described as a parasite yeah so um what a kind of court hanger on or yeah he's he's not an aged counselor so one is a counselor who's been assigned by the king as uh, as you know to help set him up the one who's advising for peace and stability whereas the uh, um the parasite is going for war so he's an he's 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 a he's an a, he's a government advisor uh, whereas the other one's a civil servant or potentially yeah. um thinking of something like uh, again because I, just because I've read it recently, Thomas of Woodstock, um, where you've got a clear distinction between a generation that is the younger prince's uh, friends and followers and the elder, wiser statesmen who are trying to, who are also his uncles, um, who are trying to advise him. Um, mm. If there were a way in this particular scene of distinguishing between, um, you know, the, 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 the wise advisor as clearly given by the king in order to bring his son up the right way and the the parasite as he's described i don't know how you'd how we'd be able to illustrate that without more of a scene that shows I, you you know that that's a separate a different kind of relationship to the other one i i, I think it's probably just casting isn't it you just have the uh, an older an older figure um and different different costuming as well um you know i think the, that's the thing i don't know if age is enough i think there's something to do with it's not just about a, a younger and an older generation it's about the different kind of relationships that these people would have had the parasite would be a flatterer and an, a supporter of things that serve the parasite himself whereas the councillor would be someone whose aim is the good of the kingdom. Mm. And how do you illustrate that without actually having a scene about that? Um, I, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think you could you can get that in visually. I mean, right, you can't elaborate on it without more material, but um, I think you can get the, the, the gist of that across. Um, I think it's helpful that I've just gone back and read that's who they are because I had no visual idea of who these two people were. Uh, um, it, you know, it's, I, I mean, the, the play's developing a kind of interesting attitude towards the role of counsellors and advice because mm. you have this, the, the act one is this kind of headstrong king with three rather ineffective counsellors and then you've got... Um, Ferex, who then has to, has kind of got this reason for why he should be swayed in, you know, to kill his brother. And then you've got a good counsellor and then you've got Herman, although I'm not precisely sure where Herman's getting his authority from. Flattery, I guess. Mm. But you've definitely got more of a dynamic going between Herman and Dorden, you know, in terms of what they're, how they're trying to get Ferex to kind of shift his behaviour. It's, it's interesting, there seems to be some kind of warn the councillors are given such big positions that there seems to be some kind of warning there about you know to elizabeth the first about council but we'll see how it works out mm, mm. well i mean looking a little ahead of course we we uh i think we have a mirror scene um with uh, with the brother uh, porex um and the uh, unfortunately named tinder um <laughs> Who I think we have to moderately rechristen tomorrow because uh, <laughs> there's, there's no way. Well, actually, I don't. I think it's quite appropriate because I think Tinder's the parasite in, uh, for for his brother. So yeah, so Tinder swiping <laughs> left or right uh, <laughs> with the kingdom fate. I'm playing him tomorrow. Thanks for that. I'm not going to have to get that out of my head all night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, again, we have uh, oh the, if, if the next scene does mirror, as I, I'm assuming it will, that oh. it's effectively the same scene but in the other country. Um, again, it gives us the possibility of some slight jigger, jiggery pokery if we mesh the two scenes together in different parts of the stage. Mm. Um, and and you you know we were talking about could some of these texts be said simultaneously or or you know and earlier, but you know. 
these elements of these scenes, how well do they actually match? I'm starting to look ahead. The, the, the next scene I think is shorter um, because it doesn't have the big speech uh, uh, anywhere near as big. Um, but it's structurally quite similar. So it, it will be interesting to see where that goes next time uh, before we go into act, uh, act three. And I'm sure it's all going to be fine. It's going to be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I have to miss this tomorrow, which is a shame. Mm. Well, I mean, if you want to read along and send us some notes. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> But uh, it's great. I love it. I love this play. Mm. I mean, I've wanted to read it for a long time. I think it's great. Mm. No, it, it, it's one that sat in the back of my mind for a long time as I've, I've sort of thought about it. Um, you know, I've read it many times and thinking, you know, that yes, it has its challenges. And I quite like plays that have their challenges. But there's enough meat here that you can really make something out of it. And, you know, it, it has a decent publishing history. It's about people do teach it, but it doesn't really have the kind of modern performance history. I think it should. Mm. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, there may be more of performance history that I don't know about. I haven't really looked into it yet, um, but I don't think there's been an awful lot of Gorbadoc action. I know there was a radio version in the fifties, um, which I don't have the LP of, but the, it, it was released in the seventies. Um, uh, and that's that's all I currently know of beyond um, I think some student uh, university productions. Uh, but that's that's for later in the week. Final thoughts from the room before we 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 close down for the night. Everyone, everyone, everyone's sort of sort of there, are we? We're all we're all there. Um, so as uh, then it all like, remains for me today say is thank you all very much for getting into act two of Gorbadoc. The acts I think get shorter as we go. Um, part from act five, I think is reasonably chunky. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for their, their contributions today and goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.